Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to the next panel discussion. Uh, I think we have one more person joining us. Uh, Artic Kempner, the director, is on his way, and of course, as a, any director, God forbid he just be on time and be here. So, I guess the helicopter is still en route. Uh, so we're, we're here to talk about the future of sports broadcasting, obviously a panel that's tailor-made for Jerry. Uh, I think what we should do first is kind of just let each panelist introduce who they are and what they do on a daily basis. And obviously with, with Jerry, I'm most curious what he does on a daily basis. Um, Jerry, why don't you begin and we'll kind of go down the list. My name is Karnak and I'm looking into the future. Um, Jerry Steinberg, consultant Fox Sports. Anyway. Consultant Fox Sports, I, by now I should know how to use a microphone. Um, and and uh, that's Jerry Steinberg. And I'm Dirk Van, oh, Dirk Van Dahl from MLBAM. Um, I oversee technology development, new technologies. Uh, field tracking is something I've been working on for the last couple of years, so I think that's why I'm here. Amy Rosenfeld, I'm the senior courting producer at ESPN, overseeing soccer, motorsports, and X Games. Good morning, I'm Jed Drake, and uh, I oversee production innovation for ESPN. So, uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, one of the secret sciences to these panel discussions is about a week before we have one of these discussions, we huddle up on a conference call and kind of go through what we should talk about, even though it looks so natural uh, and no one can see the questions coming, we've kind of you know, treated it like wrestling and scripted it out. Whoever watches wrestling. Uh, this time, though, we didn't do that, so we are going to fly blind a little bit. Uh, so, so that kind of makes it more fun. Um, so let's start with um, 3D. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> no. No, I'm just, see, laughter is encouraged. I can give you some cheap glasses. Yeah. Uh, no, let's start with, with 4K. Uh, obviously, it's a topic that, uh, that, that we're talking about a lot on all these different conferences and, and panels, and, and it's obviously pretty prevalent in the booth. And, uh, a lot of people are now supporting 4K, you know, whether it's the, the, the pan and scan and, and the cropping, you know, whether it's an Everts or, or an EVS or Aja or whomever, and the cameras are now getting to the point where they can start over cranking and stuff. What I would like to talk about, though, when it comes to 4K is we know what we all do now. We all kind of do the same thing where you take the image and you zoom in and you do your super zoom or whatever. But, but what is the next iteration of what we're going to do with this? Is, is getting 4K into the home the next project? Or is there something else out there 4K related that we can do that, that is right behind the corner? What, what do you think, Chair? I, th I think what's different now than, than how it's been before as, as we've made other changes as an industry is that for the first time for 4K, there's alternate distribution. You know, there's 4K to Netflix, there's 4K to Amazon, there's there's a whole bunch of um, Samsungs with 4K ready sets that'll do streaming stuff. So there's an, there's an audience out there which I believe is going to grow exponentially. And you know, it's, it's, it's you know, what, whatever, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll start us producing content in 4K to deliver to the, you know, because where there's eyeballs, we'll find them. All right. what, what, what do you think, Dirk? Uh, What's baseball you know, it's representing sort of the streaming side of the equation. I think it's a little bit further off for us. I mean, we're just to the point where we can really support um, uh, good HD signals at the at the standard bandwidths that IB, uh, ISPs are delivering today. So it's a little bit further off for us. And again, as devices, uh, as more devices can support that, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to lift a stack up to that. But it'll be a fall for us. I mean, from the ESPN side, and I guess you guys have different approaches on it, depending on what you're doing on a daily basis. but. I mean, is, is, is ESPN producing entirely 4K productions at this point? Is it something that's on the roadmap? Look, it's always something that's going to be on the roadmap. And even as I look out, I see some of my colleagues here who, who work in it every day. Um, but the, I think the, what we're going to need to see is where the industry is going to go in terms of, of uh, the commercial industry and, and decide whether or not 4K is going to become the next 3D in terms of a massive... Uh, roll out of this. Um, so you really got that level and then as, as we say alternative uh, distribution plans and then within our broadcast we all know that at varying degrees we're working with 4K um, and it's an exciting technology that uh, we're able to take advantage of and I think that's going to continue um, because I think it's one of those those great devices that ultimately uh, allows us to tell far better stories and you know we've seen that in every broadcast I mean that that's used 4k not just ours I mean a a Amy you kind of agree that you think it's a game changer when it comes to the storytelling of an event you think being able to zoom in and, and whatever you know what other advantages it leads to changes the content changes the story of, of the game of the broadcast 
Yeah, I mean, certainly I think the ability to have such control over the image will advance the ability to really do tactical analysis of a video. I think the thing that will be interesting, and I'm curious to hear what my co-panelists have to say, is as we all are sort of slave to the distribution situation, at what point are we watching the Japanese already come out with 8K, and now we almost find ourselves a little bit behind the curve, and we haven't even distributed it to the United States yet. So I'm curious sort of, you know, as we sit and wait, and we have trucks in 4K, and we're doing ISO replays in 4K, are the Japanese doing full shows in 8K? We should just jump to 16K. That'll show them. <laughs> uh, there's just no. one other thing, too, that I think is always sort of fascinating when you talk about these technologies. None of them are ever in a vacuum unto themselves. So even now, what we're seeing with 4K are discussions about where we can use that technology and interlace other things on top of it. Because, you know, with a 4K system, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily give up all the, the sort of things that we're, we're contemplating. But, you know, in an end zone position with a 4K, when you start thinking about the kinds of tracking things that we're doing and, and which part of the screen you may ultimately want to deal with, um, you know, it just, it, 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 the, the confluence of, of these new technologies is inevitable, and I think that's really where the fun begins, is when you start layering them on top of each other. And you can make an argument that if you were to have more 4K cameras on site, you could probably end up with fewer regular cameras because the 4K can cover such a, a wide spectrum, right? I mean... Yeah, in, in ISO fashion, of course, yeah. yeah. Artie just came in, and th that's the last guy to give up any cameras, so. All right, so that concludes the panel. Thank you, everybody, for your time. <laughs> uh, welcome, Artie. So, so obviously, the panel is on the future of broadcasting. Uh, we just kind of finished up a whole thing on 4K uh, from a director's point of view. Uh, what, what, what do you think of the 4K stuff? I mean, is it, is it hard to, you know, to manage and fit into the show, or is it one of those toys that you actually really love having on the front bench? I, I think the biggest issue right now is training people to use the machine properly. I mean, we've got a great, we've got one guy at Fox who's outstanding, Rich Sloman, and we've got to train 5, 10, 25, 30 more, because I, I've, I've said this before here, this is the future for us. I mean, you can do a lot more with Probably less equipment, though I didn't say that out loud for, uh, for you, Jed. Um, because it can get you places that typically you wouldn't be able to get to. So, but the key is, it's not the camera operator as much as it is the replay operator. Right. But also with the camera operator, uh, Artie, what we're also finding now is that we have to untrain them from certain things. Because, yeah. because you know, again, with 4K, you're trying to get to a specific spot and be able to have that in focus and in frame. Um, you know, with baseball, it's a heck of a lot easier because you have a pretty good idea of where they're going. With football, it's an entirely different thing, which requires sort of a, uh, an, an uneducating of their sort of innate skills that they've developed over the years as camera people. Well, every camera guy wants to go in tight. Right. And, and the lenses... They, 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 they just want to go in tight because that's what they've been trained and they've to made, do. And they've made you know, a lot of glass for it. I mean, the lenses allow you to go in tight even if you don't need to. You, know, you could still put these long lenses on it still. Well, you have to understand responsibility. And I think that's the most important thing as a director. When you're, in, when you're having your camera meeting, you really got to explain to people where you fit in and what you're trying to do. So that, that's the most important thing. But what Jed's saying is like typically a guy who does low third or high third, excuse me, he's going to be looking to do this, this, and this in a certain situation. Well, now, no, don't do that. Hang here, but kind of frame with that line in, that type of thing. Runner on second, ball's hit, go to home immediately. Um, and, and obviously, if anyone has any questions uh, along the way, you know, just, just raise your hand and, and Jerry will call on you. Uh, change of topic for a second. A, an area that I don't feel like everyone's really discussing, but I think it's one of those cool topics that, that's certainly flying around, all pun intended, are, are drone cameras. Uh, I think I saw a shot on, was it Fox the other day, where they followed uh, some kind of a, a fighter through from his car through like into the gym itself as he was going in for a workout or something. And it was just really cool. And, and I think it's one of those things that we're all kind of dancing around because it's going to start becoming a major part. Maybe even stuff for like the X Games and stuff I thought it'd be great for. I can't imagine that. I just uncracked a code for you guys at ESPN. Um, any, any, any thoughts about the whole drone business? I mean, are, are these things going to start finding themselves on sporting events in live capacity? You're not going to, I mean, we, we, um, we had some great drone shots um, at golf this past weekend, but it was when nobody was around. I mean, they're not going to let you fly drones over, over 60, 70,000 people in a, in a building be, because it's, you know, somebody thinks it's a great TV shot. That's not gonna happen. It's, you know, it's, it's, 
it's, it's a lot, you know, it's perceived to be a lot more dangerous than a camera that you're flying on a wire. You Even know, though they've got like that home base mechanism where it retreats back to its home and... I'm just a TV guy, you gotta to talk to the <laughs> FAA. I mean, all right, well that's, that's the next people. panel. But Jerry, that is the issue and uh, I actually talked, uh, a good friend of mine is working with the FAA and they finally started to kind of, I, I guess, kind of treat this seriously in a lot of ways people want to use it. So what they're doing right now actually in Jersey is working with the FAA and they're talking about anybody that's flying a drone, certainly when we talk about what we do professionally, is going to have to be a licensed pilot. So I think what the FAA is so, they're so far behind in this situation right now. I mean, we, we, had, we had an issue at NASCAR, we were doing a feature and our drone uh, may, may or not have crashed. Um, not, during, not during a race or anything like that, but during a piece, it kind of just kind of fell Yeah, but I mean, you know, sky, sky cams and cable cams have crashed. Yeah, they? yeah, yeah. I've, I've been a... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too soon? Or yeah. what was that? <laughs> With me, it's never too soon. It's never going to go away, though. I, I, we had a cable cam. The cable got cut, and it dropped out of the... Yeah, that didn't... The cable cam didn't drop, okay? The cable fell down. The cable cam had redundant, redundant, redundant wiring to make sure it didn't come down. But the cable came down and that stopped the race and that's never a good thing in television. And it means in NASCAR now we're set back five years before we can use something like that again, which is really the worst thing. All right, well, on, a, on a lighter note. Uh, an area that I saw, uh, I think on the, on the sports video uh, site last week, I think Chris Calcinario was quoted talking about, you know, more and more ESPN remote productions that are gonna start to be produced in Bristol. And, and sending you know, the cameras and audio back and having the commentator stay at home. Uh, and I don't know if this applies to the Fox stuff. I imagine with the FS1 stuff, it's gotta be in, in, in discussions as well. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, is that, is that seemingly growing as the way of doing production for you guys now? Yeah, I mean, I think that when you're in a position of tonnage, and certainly we're in a position of tonnage, you need to make strategic decisions that fit the right financial model. I mean, I think what we've, uh, looked at is, is there a way to continue to provide the quantity without a huge decay in the quantity, the, the quality of the quantity? And ultimately, I think we've been successful. We've already done at least two match, two games in that model. And, you know, I think certainly on a, on a big matchup, that wouldn't be the execution, but there really was no traceable idea that that game was produced, directed, called from Bristol. We, we were remote tallying the cameras and honestly, I'm not sure anyone could tell on a four camera, you know, sort of lower level basketball game. I think for all of us, what you're gonna start seeing is sort of a, a, a gap that's gonna develop rather quickly between the, the low budget productions and the higher end productions. And I think it's, it's simple business that it's return on investment where I think the higher productions are gonna to continue to get the 4K kinds of things uh, times 10, if appropriate, based upon what we spend on these events for rights. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to see those events that are gonna to have to be covered much more economically than they have. So, you know, the day of the, the 50 to $70,000 remote is probably going to be waning rather quickly. And, um, and it's just taking resources and using them more appropriately as we, uh, as, we, as this technology becomes available and, and allows us to do that. I mean, Artie, I can't imagine at this stage of your career you're doing these, these three or four camera shows back at the studio, but as a director, I mean, how much does that affect the way you cut the show? If you're not there on site with the crew, controlling the action, I mean, do you think it's a major compromise? Or, or as a director, are you able to say, listen, I understand this is what you have to do to save a few dollars, I'm okay with it. I just got really depressed for my kids who are at Ithaca College, both majoring in, in television and radio because of doing uh, remote productions from outside. But I do understand it for a four camera basketball game, and I, I think there are certain sports you can certainly do that, and it makes a lot of sense. I, I was working with Disney about uh, six years ago on uh, intelligent camera, and uh, actually having cameras being able to follow the action on their own without people. I think for when you start to look about uh, doing how many college basketball games are you guys doing, how many we're doing at FS1, and that number is going to continue to grow, every game is going to be able to cover. You can do it as a director. I think the biggest issue is for talent at times, especially when you're talking about 
a larger field of play, it's only a football game, to see what else is going on outside of the camera view. That's the one thing about in directing, you've got to tell your camera guys and be, be clear, you're my eyes out here. You've got to find stuff that's not just on court in front of you. So I think that's the biggest issue, Jason, when you're talking about going to that model. But that model is, is here and it's going to come more and more because for certain sports, I think it makes a lot of financial sense. Uh, let's take another turn. I feel like when I watch sports today, you know, the cameras aside, and we see a fair share of, of different high-speed cameras and POVs and the 4K thing doing their thing, I feel like one of the areas that probably gets pushed most on a daily basis are the areas of graphics, uh, analytics, statistics. Uh, in our case at HBO, we're big into virtual, and um, we use ORAD on it every show, all show long with the virtual graphics. Uh, I think that's, that's Dirk's time. I think he's got a video for us. If you waited patiently, I think you get now a, a minute and six second video for us. Um, Karen, why don't you, I guess, roll that video now, and then we'll dive into a conversation about this part of the, of the show. Yeah, this is a StatCast clip. Joe Panic and Brandon Crawford was a key contributor to the Giants' 3-2 triumph over the Royals to win the 2014 World Series. With the game tied at two in the third, Jeremy Affelt faced Eric Hosmer with Lorenzo Kane at first base. Hosmer drilled a fastball up the middle with an exit velocity of 106.1 miles per hour upon contact. Second baseman Joe Panic's first step reaction time was actually negative three one hundredths of a second, which means he anticipated that the ball would be hit to his right and was virtually moving in that direction as the ball was hit. After fully laying out to snag the hard ground ball, Panic's release time to flip the ball to shortstop Brandon Crawford is 83 one hundredths of a second. Panic pushed himself up with his arms and makes the flip all in one motion and all in less than one second. As for Crawford, his first step reaction time upon the ball being hit was also a negative figure, negative 91 one hundredths of a second in this case. That means Crawford was already moving to his left nearly a full second before. Wow, All right. my, my, my reaction time on jokes is also less than a second, but <laughs> what, what was that? I mean, explain to I, us I, how that's done. And I, Yeah, I mean, what we're now doing is we're, <laughs> we, you know, we're, we can drill down, we're, we're, we're sampling uh, field position of all the players, runners, and uh, coaches right now, 30 frames a second, and then from that court, as well as uh, sampling the, uh, the ball position with radar, and then we're taking all that data together and uh, determining player uh, metrics pretty much in real time. I mean, the goal here is to tell a story. Now, this is a rather elaborately told story, but we really believe that having field or defensive data now has been the thing that we've been missing in this kind of statistic-driven storytelling, and, and that's um, uh, where we think this is, where this is headed. Because Dirk brought a video, he gets bonus questions. Uh, what does pretty much real time mean? I mean, how long after that play at second is that statistic not only available, but able to be rendered and produced where graphically it can be displayed on air? That, that is the question. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to accelerate that process. There are certain things that occur in real time, live leadoffs, we can, we, we can figure that out. In near real time, in a matter of seconds, we can determine things like top speed, um, acceleration, uh, first step can be brought about. The secondary and tertiary metrics, things like root efficiency or other types of uh, calculations that use the primaries, takes a little bit longer. We're trying to get it within 12 seconds, but then replay is really what, what our target is. Now, I feel like a lot of plays have those stats, but maybe they're just not super noteworthy to stop the truck and get it on air, but they're still somewhat interesting. Are you finding that you're able to still push that stuff to like second screen devices? Are they hitting you know, social streams or does it just die on the graphics room floor? Well, I think one of the things we're looking at is these are examples of, of intra-game stats, but we really want to collect everything so we have inter-game stats, things across seasons or across years, so we can begin comparing uh, the relative quality of, of what's going on. I think it'll help us understand when something that was um, hard was made look easy by actually being able to quantify it. And I think that'll help producers understand, hey, this is exceptional. This is, this is worth mentioning. So it, it just helps us uh, 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 hint that for them. All right. I think, I think if once you get past the, um, the developmental piece of this and you develop a database that, that, that has, you know, historical data that you can compare, 
if a player is slowed down and mm -hmm. you, you, could, you could you attach a story to, to what seems to be too much information and get, you know, gives you a headache. That's, you know, uh, right. I, I, I think this is a little bit of overkill, but right now that's still sort of exciting, and I think for serious fans, this, this kind of detail is appealing. But we can tell more simple stories, just this is an important event. Uh, one thing we're also looking at is, is using artificial intelligent al algorithms, essentially in real time, to l learn if there is a change in the win probability of the game based on what just happened. And that actually helps producers say, hey, listen, this may not have looked important, but it is important because of X, Y, Z. And, and we can actually surface uh, data as to why it's, something has changed now in the game, even if it doesn't seem important. I didn't think artificial intelligence was going to be used on this, on this panel, but um, <laughs> I, I feel like that this is a trend, right, on, on the sports side. I mean, whether it's a Marshawn Lynch and, and as, you know, analyzing how far he actually ran on that run or the baseball pitch counts or where the ball is being thrown or hit, I feel like every sport's kind of doing this. I mean, what's the ESPN and Fox, you know, new approach to this stuff? What are you guys trying from an analytical approach and from a graphics and how all that marries together? Well, I think specifically on the World Cup uh, that we did this past June, it's a little bit of a struggle because in soccer, there's still this component of, you know, a wide variety of people that don't even really understand the rules. And then we have these diehard fans, and then we have people who are just kind of sampling because it's the U.S. versus Belgium. And Ultimately, I think what we've been trying to do is dig into some of those metrics and figure out how can we provide that data where it's additive and not intrusive. So specifically on the soccer, we actually went uh, sort of the touchscreen route and really dove into, while we weren't really tracking the metrics of, of the individual athletes, we really look at formation and how you can look at the different formations and how that will impact the, the match. I think, you know, what, what Jed's been doing with the NFL and football, it's a, it's a bigger data component, baseball being the highest. So I think it's trying to figure out, you know, a game like soccer, does that have the statistical data that's even impactful and interesting and how to find that balance? I mean, NFL, obviously different. I think it's both, it's a real conundrum uh, in how you're going to do this and a real opportunity in another way. The conundrum is, in order to get all this data and all this equipment, you've got to spend a lot of money. In order, to, in order for you to make any kind of profit on this money that you're spending, it's got to go to a massive audience. So I, I think that's incredible. You know, the baseball, if I'm a niche viewer, I want to see that. If I'm a real technical guy, I'm into baseball, I'm into all the, those dynamics, that's one thing. I just think it's the platforms that you deliver it on, and there's going to be more and more niche markets and more platforms, and how do you monetize that? The bottom line is all this stuff, though, this technology costs a lot of money, and it's hard to integrate in your basic entertainment part of your larger broadcast. So. But do you feel, besides the money and the ROI, do, do you feel like it also, though, hinders the, the story you're trying to tell as you're cutting the show. I mean, we were big into virtual. Do you feel like at some point you're just worrying about the camera shots and the drama and the moment, and all of a sudden they're shoving these statistics down your throat, and hey, this graphics mean has this doohickey stat ready to go. We want to do virtual on the field with the score. Like, do you feel like you wanted to say, just, just leave me alone, let me cut my cameras? To quote our legendary producer, Bob Stenner, if we're not careful, we're going to technology ourselves right out of this business. I think if graphics go down and all this technology goes down and you still got eight cameras and pictures, you're going to have the same viewership. So I, I really still believe we're in the picture and, and, and sound medium, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, the enhancements, they have to be produced well. That's the most important thing. If you make the enhancement the, a priority, instead of the opposite way around, they, then you're going to start to, I think, infringe upon the viewer's entertainment value and their enjoyment of the game. Never cross the bounds of the integrity of the game and what the viewer wants to see. That's the, that's the rule that I have. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I think this technology is really nascent now, and we, haven't, we really need to get it in the hands of the storytellers. Having said that, you know, in, in, the, in the web experience, we can sort of make this off on a sidebar, and we can also customize it somewhat to the viewers. So if there are fans who don't quite understand things, we could, we could 
tailor it to, to that particular fan, or we could, of course, give the whole, all bells and whistles to the Avid fan as well. We could even make it an overlay as well. I think in the data aspect of it, I think it's, I think it's inevitable that all of this is going to happen at, at some point in, in all of the, uh, all the major leagues. I, I, I do think that's, that's a foregone conclusion, but to the points that are being made here, you know, where we are right now is trying to define what the difference is between trivial and meaningful in terms of the data. And um, that's going to be that process so that ultimately we are still able to televise an event without over encumbering it with this overt storytelling to complement it without taking away from it and then recognizing that inevitably there are any number of places where this data can be used either as, during the live telecast as a, as a complement on a second screen or you know, dare, I dare say that, that the surround programming that is uh, adjacent to the event, whether that's on the day or on the week or the year, ultimately as this database continues to grow, is where the real, real advantage is going to become. J and Jason, return, the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, to return to one of the other things we were talking about was um, automatically driven cameras. We've, we're beginning to experiment with coordinate driven cameras um, to assist. I, don't, I think that you'll always have flagship cameras and operators, but maybe specialty cameras could be coordinate driven. And I think there's a value there. And certainly it's, it's, it's more effective or cost effective. I think the real, the, the real issue that we have to all look, that we all look at, and whether it's technology or production, is how do we bring more viewers in to watch our broadcasts? Whether it's uh, over the air, whether it's a cable, uh, cable type platform, internet, whatever, streaming, however that is, that's really why we're doing a lot of this, is to bring more eyes to the whatever device you're using to watch. And I think that's always going to be the challenge. And that right now, as things become, you have more and more choices, it makes it more and more difficult to us to keep eyes and gain new eyes. Uh, I think we have only about 10 minutes left on, on this. Uh, any questions out there? There's got to be something for this fine group. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, is, is how do we manage the impact of, 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 you know, this technology and the data and the stats in relation to, I think, how it affects the game? And I think that gets back into the, the you know, the age-old question of are we doing it because it matters or are we doing it because we can? I mean, is that fair? Well, there's certain data like that, that you showed that you're going to get in relatively real time that, that if they're watching in the dugout, it, it creates a competitive edge for one team against the other. You, you, if, you, if you can see because of some sort of tracking or some technology that um, a pitcher's re release point or mechanics are changing is, is, is going to show fatigue, that, that's impactful. You know, it's impactful in, in the other dugout. Yeah. People have been seeing that for a while. I mean, that, that's, I think that's been out there for a while. I, um, one of the things is we're trying to make all, of, all data available to all people so that no one has a competitive edge there. We're only beginning to talk about having computers in the dugout and actually allowing this. I think it's a very fair question, though. Um, most of our data now, I think, is, is being used historically so that people can, can, can manage their teams better. Again, for us, it's just, you know, baseball is a game of, of inches and a game of tenths of seconds, and we've never had the defensive side of the story. I, I totally agree with you that story is really what we're about here, what we're trying to build. Um, that's what engages the audience. Um, uh, but we have to have the data first, and then we'll see, uh, put it in the hands of the creators, and we'll see what they can do with it. Yeah, I mean, even on the HBO side, you know, we refrain from putting our scorecard up on the, on the screens in the arena just because we do our own version of who's winning the fight, and we never even want to impact the fighters in the middle of the action with, oh, yeah, HBO said I was losing. Well. We, you know, we'd, we did our own scorecard, but we're not going to yeah. show it in the arena for the fears of them seeing it. <laughs> it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, for years, the, the, the leagues, whether it's NASCAR, the NFL, they want to protect some of this data. And I think it took a long time for the next-gen stats to kind of come through because if you start to use all this data and look at a player on 62 defensive snaps, how often did he come off with this mass, this, this force? And then they come back and go, well, you, you, only, you really only hustled on 42.7% of your plays, right? And that's the type of thing that you start balancing. With NASCAR, we, we deal with, with a lot of data, but only certain data is available to us and available to the teams. So kind of what you're asking is almost a bigger scheme, not just a competitive advantage, but what people want out there and what they want the teams to have, what they want agents to have, players to have, that type of thing. 
and we are working hard to control the level of fidelity that we release. There'll be sort of a lower fidelity available to everyone, and the more higher fidelity ones may be kept more in-house. You know, one thing that's interesting is that the growth of fantasy leagues has actually been a big driver in some of these statistics. Right. And I certainly, for my fantasy league, would like to know how much, you know, Marshawn Lynch has run. So it'll become yet another data point, whether it's Vegas or whether it's the, you know, the fantasy leagues that will see this growth of the desire to have more data points on each athlete. Uh, I mean, we have a few more minutes. I can tell more bad jokes, or uh, is there any other questions out there? <laughs> uh, there's one back there. Question, question for Artie. You were saying going against potentially having some of that data, but I think to Amy's point, you know, it actually could drive more eyes or viewers, so to speak, oh, for oh, yeah. another subscription service or more revenue. I, I'm for the data. What my, my, I'm saying that some of this has been slow to kind of come through and to be developed because you're going to have an agent going in to negotiate with, uh, with a club president, you know, with, with the general manager, and the general manager is going, well, I have this data, and it says here and here, and the agent and the agent's going, well, wait a second, he did this and this. He hit 322, and he did this. Yeah, but he only hustled on, like I said, he only hustled on X amount of plays. So for us, we want to have as much data as possible and then kind of make those production decisions on what makes sense to use. Look, we're not in the business to embarrass or insult people, but if you have some of this data, you can go, look at this guy. On, on running plays, he never comes off the ball as a receiver, so you know it's a running play. And those types of things. It's a two-edged sword are, there, too. I, I mean, you can also show that this person is an exceptional athlete. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Right, but typically the, 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 the hard numbers have spoken for whether or not a guy is good or bad. Now we have more in-depth data that opens up a lot of doors or Pandora's box. Fair. Uh, what about, I feel like we've hammered graphics and, and cameras. Uh, we haven't even talked about audio. Um, I, I know we've got a few minutes left, but, but what are we doing in audio that's, that's new? I mean, is, is, is still evolving from the surround sound, still the emphasis, or is it access with microphones that becomes more of a daily discussion? What are you guys saying? It's, it's, it's all about access. I mean, you know, We'll, we'll, we'll put microphones wherever they let, let us. You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, David, David talked, you know, David talked about people who could see around corners earlier. And, um, and you know, he, he, he's one of those people. And um, from, from the very beginning, it was about bringing the viewer closer to the playing field. And like when we, when we first got baseball, all you really heard was the announcers in the crowd. And now you hear everything. You, you heard, you heard Bumgarner grunting as 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 he let go of the ball. And um, that's about access, you know. And and you know we get, you know we get so much access. They try to, they try to back us off. I, I don't I don't think anybody sitting in their living room on a Sunday wants to hear less. They want to hear more. You know when you hear, when you hear Aaron Rodgers or you hear or you hear Peyton, you know, Omaha Omaha kill, 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 you're like right on the field. Thank God I know that's a football call. You know, we, yeah, we, you know, we offer multiple audio tracks, uh, home and away feeds, but we also offer Nat Sound, which still remains popular. It's just the crack of the bat, the roar of the crowd, and it's in a, a really pleasurable way to just enjoy the game. I think if we could get athletes to just reduce the amount of swear words they use by 50%, <laughs> And we would have fin the scene of Lord. Yeah. <laughs> well, we wouldn't I, have anything to say. I, I produce I used to produce a lot of women's sports and I thought that would be fifty percent less, it was fifty percent more. Um, but ultimately I, I think I if we could figure out a way to really provide the viewer some of the insights. You know, we've got made some progress with Mike and coaches and when you get beyond sort of the go get him, go get him, and you really have, you know, some of the tactics. I, for me, I think that's where we can really advance the viewer experience is giving that behind the scenes that you, you wouldn't get by being in the stands. That's really the value of television. You know, what Steve Sable created NFL Films, we all still try to grab in, in every live game. And whether, no matter what sport it is, it brings your viewer closer. It makes it more intimate. It makes every picture that much better. And 
when it was Jerry said, it's the access. If we have the access, the technology's been there for years. So we're going to use as much as they'll let us use. I mean, and to Amy's point, during the World Series, where's Jack Simmons? So Jack Simmons is down in TOC, and they had the standards and practices guy riding his wing, right? And I'm watching in the house, all of a sudden, there's dead space. And then I get, I get the email with the reports when the game's over, and Jack writes, the guy hit the plunger 15 times. <laughs> so, you, you know, it, you're never going to stop it. You know, you just, you just have to, I guess, manage it. I, I, I'm not offended by anything, but that's just me, so. <laughs> I can't believe you got the biggest laugh out of all of this. Uh, I think we're out of time, but I see one more hand. I'm sure Ken and Marty are going to yell at me, but, but is there one more question over there? Oh, Lenny? I'm sure Artie would swearing. love that. <laughs> you think yeah. they're swearing I, by the athletes. I happen to think it's an outstanding idea on a pay-per-listen <laughs> basis. You'll get Artie arrested. You'll get some money on that pay-per-listen. The pay Kempner group listen. would be happy to accommodate those people that would like to pay for that service. The local police will drag Artie out of the truck, so <laughs> yeah. you got Hey, in NASCAR, if you buy a headset, we're on an RF frequency, so people do monitor that, that channel. I don't know how many, though. Uh, all right, I think on that note, I think we're out of time. If I could get a round of applause for a wonderful panelists.